From the Laws of Human Nature, Chapter 9, L The Law of Repression, Deciphering the Shadow, Contradictory Behavior, The Extreme Entrepreneur. At first glance, these types seem to possess very positive qualities, especially for work. They maintain very high standards and pay exceptional attention to detail. They are willing to do much of the work themselves. If mixed with talent, this often leads to success early on life. But underneath the facade, the seeds of failure are taking root. This first appears in their inability to listen to others. They cannot take advice. They need no one. In fact, they mistrust others who do not have their same high standards. With success, they are forced to take on more responsibility. If they were truly self-reliant, they would know the, the importance of delegating on a lower level to maintain control on the higher level. But something else is stirring within the shadow. Soon, the finances are ruined and they become completely dependent on doctors or outside financiers. They go from complete control to total dependence on others. Think of the pop star Michael Jackson near the end of his life. Often, their outward show of self-reliance disguises a hidden desire to have others take care of them. To regress to the dependency of childhood. They can never admit this to themselves or show any signs of such weakness. But unconsciously, they are drawn to creating enough chaos that they break down and are forced into some form of dependency. There are signs beforehand, recurrent health issues, the sudden micro needs to be pampered by people in their daily lives. But the big sign comes as they lose control and fail to take steps to hold this. It is best to not get too entangled with such types later on their careers as they have tendency to bring about much collateral damage mm -hmm. i wonder if uh you could comment a bit about subscription services and how that impacts kind of the user experience and then you guys on the developer side we have tiered systems like the recently announced changes to playstation plus you also have xbox game pass and the ability for developers to launch into there at, at various sizes of games mm -hmm. uh, could you comment a bit on on how those subscription services uh are, are viewed in your eyes as someone who's kind of been there cutting the deals jumping systems at various times to make sure the things get done well, um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, let me give you an example. I'll give you an example is, and it's around Soulstorm, is we, out of necessity to get the project done, and we were, um, you know, hitting, hitting a number of uh, leg, technical debt, legacy issues and talent issues and, you know, Game industry is emerging fast, huge companies are paying fortunes. We're just independent self-finance. It's harder to retain, harder to contract companies, a lot of shifting 
uh, things in the landscape, you know, shifting sands. And the Sony was uh, like, hey, um, we, you know, why don't we do a deal? And we were, I, I think we were making a PS5, you know, look, look kind of cool. And um, they were like, why don't we do a deal? And the way we were working out the intention of a deal was that we would be free for a month on plus. Uh, but we were supposed to deliver in January. So at that time, there wasn't going to be any game machines. I mean, you, we were like, how many could we possibly sell? No one ever penetrates more than like 10%, 11% on a, on a new launch. You know, even the most successful titles, you think like, oh, everyone bought this title for that new machine. But then you find out, man, 20% is enormous if someone got that on a new launch. Right. For a single title. And uh, and then COVID just completely, uh, you know, kicked us in the gut because we were distributed development across the planet. Now every studio that we're working with is going into lockdown. So now we had, you know, a number of studios in the mix and now all of a sudden they're all locked down and everyone's working from home and no one can hand a controller next to them, to the other person. That's how you build games. Right. So I never would have said, if we said, Oh, COVID's going to lock down, you're just going to have to deliver the game, you know, with no one working together. It was like, we can't do that. I never would have said we can do that, but it was forced upon us and we had to, you know, figure out how to prevail. But that's a long way of saying we, we needed the money to complete the project. And we thought we did a pretty good deal because we were like, well, we got this much money. And, and in January, we, we could, there's no way we'll sell more than this. And that's more than the, that's less than the most we could sell is less than the money we could get. So that seems like good. Let's do the deal. So we did the deal. Now, at no fault to Sony's, just, you know, co and then COVID happened, right? This delayed us from January to April. The deal was still for one free month. What we thought was that we might maybe sell like 50,000 units at launch, you know, or, or you know, maybe 100,000. It was pretty small numbers because there wasn't going to be a lot of PS5s and lockdown had affected. It looked like it was going to affect the number of machines manufactured as well. So there will be shortages at retail, which for our deal would be, you know, kind of a good thing, right? I think looking at it selfishly, it would be kind of good because then there wouldn't be as many game machines out there to get the free game. Mm -hmm. But because it slipped to April, uh, we had the highest downloaded game on PS5. And it was, I think, approaching, uh, at the end of the day, close to 4 million units or something like that for free because they were all subscription. And so this was the free game for that month to subscribers. So for right. us, it was devastating. Um, and so that's how kind of the economies would work. Before you had free months, you know, you might, make a deal on a certain number of units, a certain price, you know, you might have, a, mm -hmm. there's different ways to do it, but right. that's how slipping can really sting the developer, right? No one did a dirty deed, you know, there's no one, no one played unfair pool. Right. This is just, you know, earth in 2020 and 2021. And so- it's yeah. wild to think that for, uh, uh, you know, getting 4 million versus, you know, a hundred, couple hundred thousand, you'd think it's a good thing. Right. Not, not when they're free, but not when they're free. Interesting. Now, at the same time, what was happening in the game industry is budgets were escalating really quickly because the new consoles, you know, PS2, PS3 was bringing in Xbox, was bringing in higher resolution of models, higher resolution of art, and greater expectation of gameplay. You know, you really had 3D capabilities now. And all of these things were accelerating the cost on games very rapidly. But that didn't mean they were selling more units. So what was happening is it was becoming worse for the mid-tier developers because games were getting ex more expensive. It was taking a lot more energy to build and you had fewer incentives because they were costing more. So the publisher's risk was higher and that just comes with a higher price on you. After sort of four of these mishaps with retail and getting the game to the public, we decided to shut down the studio. We didn't want it leveraged against us in a cheap acquisition. 
which is a common practice that happens in the business, which is you just draw out the negotiation. And let's say you're, by that time, our overhead was like a million dollars a month. And so let's say uh, someone can drag out the negotiation three months longer. That's $3 billion you burned out of your bank just to stay alive to sign the contract. And now you're in a weaker position. So now they can get all the better terms that they want. This is just common capitalistic practices, right? It's not anything unique to the game industry. This is just common business. So with all that, we decided to shut down the studio in 2005. But we held on to the IP because we believed it never had its fair shake in the marketplace. We always believed that it, it had a great start pretty much, but it tripped out of the gate and then it tripped, tripped, tripped. And we said, this hasn't ha seen its glory. It has a much greater capability. So from that period forward, we held on to the IP. We waited for digital distribution to become a thing. And around 2008, it was enough of a thing on Steam that we could start putting our games up that were taking, you know, 600 megabytes for Abe's Odyssey, 1,200 megabytes, 1 1.2 gigabytes for Abe's Exodus. We could at least start getting the games up on a store and publishing them ourselves. No marketing campaign, nothing. All that we had was Gabe Newell saying, I like your games. You can put them on our store. And we were like, There's, this is the beginning, if it can work. We put them up there, and miraculously, the games started selling. They sold way more than we would have thought. With time, Sony is allowing you to publish digitally, right? And, and uh, even though it's a PS3 error, the PS3 has the backward compatibility to PSX games. So all of a sudden, we could play Abe's Odyssey and Abe's Exodus on PS3. So we put them on a digital store. Sony was letting us self-publish. All of a sudden, now there's two stores that we're starting to sell. Then Xbox finally lets self-publishing happen. It's three stores. And so then we start making enough money that we could just read HD a stranger and get him on to PlayStation 3 where he never was before and do these conversion things. But we were really just now organically not raising money, just earning money through self-publishing to the point where we get to the point where we said, let's make Abe's Odyssey again. In the audience, we were saying, we don't have a lot of money, but what would you like to see? They were like, redo Abe's Odyssey, but you know, do it like cool now, right? And so we did, we basically rebuilt it in true 3D which was still 2.5D as a play format through 3D. And the success of that surpassed what we wanted, or su I should say surpassed what our expectations were. And at the end of the day, it moved, we got about three and a half million downloads on that game, just selling it digitally with no marketing campaign, no, no real, we had some buyouts for a free month here, free, or a free week here, a free week there, whatever, which helped expose. But basically our model was if we build really unique creative games, then stores will advertise it in their slow week periods. That became our model. It was like, we can't afford to buy the airtime from them, but if we have good products, when they have a slow week, they'll put us up for sale and they'll highlight it and they'll push us. And that worked out. Leading to the point where the game had an, New and Tasty, the remake of Abe's Odyssey, had enough success to put us in a position where we could actually make a new game and pay for it ourselves, which meant we didn't have any publishers, we didn't have anyone to bail us out, we could totally sink or swim on this uh, on our own, and we'll see at the end of the day where we really end up, you know, because it's not cheap, it's, it's really, it's the most ambitious game we ever made, but what we decided was, we said, let's take this opportunity right here, Let's build the exodus we wanted to build, and let's then do what we can today. So let's get back to that brew story. Let's put it back into the epic where it should have been. Let's reboot that, because we just did a remake of Abe's Odyssey, now called New and Tasty. It got a great Metacritic. It took number 10 PC Metacritic of the year, which was a total surprise of us. We would have had Xbox 2, but we were one reviewer short you know, for top 10 of the year, which was like, are we kidding? This is a remake of a 20-year-old 20, uh, 20 game. So that worked out, and with Soulstone, we were like, this is our chance. If we blow it, we've got no one to blame but ourselves. We can self-publish across the spectrum. We can build the game we always wanted to build, and we can do it in a distributed environment where we can go around the world and try to secure the resources we have, which means my morning wakes up with West Coast time zone, Quebec, and East Coast time zone. The phone calls are Scotland, UK, uh, Scotland, England, and Ireland, and Morocco. That's my morning dailies call. My evening dailies call is with the team of engineers that are in Perth, Australia. That starts around 9 o'clock with, you know, this is myself and Benny, our executive producer, who's a partner with me through this whole Soulstorm venture, uh, who's amazing. And, and, like, we're really, we're taxed really hard to pull this together because we're doing it, distributed development across the whole planet. 
And which means there's not a nighttime when anyone's really sleep, when everyone's sleeping. Like no matter what, someone's working 24 hours a day. And that's just a continuous cycle to try and get this game there, you know, for the year in the, in the year ahead that we want to deliver. And if we pull it off, then I think we will have really not only get, got the game we wanted to build, uh, but we got to escalate that and take the time with it. I mean, we're going on, I think we're going into year four plus on this. It's taken a while. It started slow. It's building bigger. It's really ambitious. It's the most sophisticated thing we've done, and hopefully it elevates the brand. But, you know, we still got a year to deliver. And as, you, as we've talked about, a lot of things happen in this business along the way. So hopefully we've done the right thing, made the right choices, and we can see people be really happy with this game when we ship it. We've experienced some of what you have, but on a much smaller scale, mm -hmm. because we don't have many international folks. We don't rely on teams who are in Australia, for as you said, or mm -hmm. um, in the UK. And but I, so we haven't hit that challenge yet. But we mm -hmm. do absolutely have the issue with, say, getting everybody together at a time that's that's relevant. So for, I'm sorry, that's convenient for them. So we mm -hmm. can see each other on the screen and compare notes versus sort of relying on telephone tag or notes mm -hmm. that were sent via email and not having that face-to-face -face or remote face-to-face -face interaction. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can totally understand how if you have somebody in Australia that you need, who needs to talk to somebody in the UK and you're the mediator and you're trying to get them to agree on something, like that's almost impossible. Right. That's our life. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, I mean, thank you. And that is concise to it. It's so hard. And uh, I just, I can't take my head off and give enough props to Benny Terry, who just, you know, who I'm telling now, like, yeah. don't ride your bike too hard. <laughs> you know, like, like, like recover, man. You got to recover. Cause this guy was uh, literally, he's like, can you get on the phone at 2 a.m.? You know, and he would say that occasionally to me, and I'd, I'd say if, to myself, "I'm like covered up the phone. I'm like, <gasps> if he could do it, I could do it. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'll be there for you." You know, but he was doing it all the time, yeah. just just relentless. He was like, "This is do or die," and and we got in. Now we got to get out. You know, and uh, and you know, like the hole you dig, right? Maintain a dialogue with reality. Hear about the flaws and inadequacies in your plan, for that is the only way to improve your skills. But if you only listen to feedback and try to make the work a complete reflection of what others tell you or want, the work will be conventional and flat. And this is probably unlikely, but would um, Slickstorm or Hand of Odd ever come into it's the future? Too it's too hard to say because the fact is we support ourselves today. We pay for our own project. I mean, we're really going for broke on this. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so what we've learned is that anything we say and we don't do, people want to kill you. Oh. Right? I've gotten plenty <laughs> of death threats and shit like that over the years. Well, for that. the game looks intimidating enough. As it is, I am going to shake if I have to manage all those fellas. Well, I, hopefully it's enjoyable. Enjoyable. You know, it leaves you, might leave you traumatized, but. Well, it's dark <laughs> with a capital D. Yeah, but that's what you guys were asking yeah. for, so it's not just our fault. You know, okay. This is you're yeah, you're held responsible too. Well, that's right. Yeah. That's right. How do you make a, a call like that? Do you make it yourself, or do you have a group that's? Well, we a, have. You know, I'd like to make the call myself, and then I get beat up, and uh, <laughs> people tell me uh, in house and out. You know, and then you're wrong on your prediction, and you get beat up by everybody. Yes. But you just try to make your best guess. I mean, you can't spend forever on a game. Eventually, you run out of money. So yeah. you got to try and be smart and try and focus on the things that really matter that are going to make a difference. And hopefully you're nurturing your, your fan base along the way, so by the time you get to market, people actually know about it, which is huge. But this time has been really surprising because just in the 
videos, the short trailers that we've been putting out, we're exceeding any views we ever had in the past. So we're now seeing, you know, millions of views on videos and things like that, and it's staggering for us. It was really important to us to to evolve it in a way that was exciting, but still tra stayed true to the original nature of that character. And yeah. I think that was a big challenging part. So we wanted the fresh blood to look at it. Something I tell people on the team, you know, whether they're engineers or designers, I go, look. The, these opinions that you're giving us, like you might be an engineer, but you have this passionate opinion about gameplay. We want to hear it. We always want to hear it, even if we don't use it, even if it feel, you feel like we're ignoring you, don't stop telling us. Right. Because for us, it's not like I need to build the game that I need to feel good about. I need to build the game that the audience needs to feel good about, right. and I need to be happy with and that. good ideas come from everywhere. And good ideas come from everywhere, so right. there's a lot of, of nurturing that. And ultimately, uh, stay true to that genre, but evolve it. Evolve it, and this is really what the audience was telling us they wanted. They wanted to see more of a classic sort of play style, but with more 21st century touches. And that's what I think we've been trying to focus on. It hasn't been easy, you know, but because we've had to figure out a new, a lot of new play styles that we had difficulty saying what other game does this well. And some of the things we're doing were just so off the cuff and different that uh, we didn't, you know, it was hard to even find comparables, which means more time of us testing and discovering and figuring out what works and what doesn't. But hopefully, we get that right. Pretty we're getting to learn who our audience was, right? Because in, right. in 97, you had no idea, and Walmart didn't you tell just, you. You hope it's everybody. You hope it's everybody. <laughs> you know, no one's filling out the form in, in retail. <laughs> but we actually got to uh, hear the audience opinion, and they wanted more of the, the Abe games in a classic sense. And so that led to us redoing Abe's Odyssey as New and Tasty, which was really close to that idea of that first part of the epic. Right. And, um, and then they said, do the next one, because we asked them, if we succeed at this, and, we, and you don't want to kill us, uh, <laughs> What do you want us to do next? And they're like, redo Exodus. And we're like, well, if we're going to go there, then why don't we just do it right? And we had enough success with New and Tasty that uh, we were able to finally do a new, entirely new game and revisit the sort of lost heritage of what we wanted to achieve and, and plug it into this one and go for it. We really wanted to push the dimension on top of the classic. And we, we were trying to study the audience. We're going, why do they still really want this 2.5D sort of platformer classic impression? And then there, there, there was reasons for that. You know, some of them were, we want a more directed experience. We, we don't want to just be aiming our camera. You know, right. we made, you know, Strange Strat, other games that were POV over the shoulder. Uh, and so we were like, this is very interesting because the reasons they wanted it was a lot of the reasons why I chose the platformer genre to begin with because I felt like I was the guardian angel over a character in a desperate situation rather than trying to project as being the character, right. which is what I am in a POV game, you know, typically. And, uh, and that's what the audience was responding to. So we said, well, if, if we're going to play with that format, how do we stay true to what made it, gave it its integrity, but how do we evolve it in ways uh, and as I would say, this is not a revolutionary game, it's an evolutionary game about revolution. And that's what really led us to start rebuilding our own, you know, self-publishing of those titles in that library. And all of that, I mean, we really are, we're not crowdfunded, but the fans are what enable us to keep on making games because they buy them. And that's a new place for us. We're not out raising money. We're actually converting those sales into new products. Now everyone's just like, shut up and take my money, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, the more that that's happening, the more grateful we are. Well, uh, a lot of it was driven by our fan base because we were really trying to analyze why we were getting such heavy requests for the old style games. They were like, no, we want the platformers. I was like, you know, I, I, I was kind of surprised that people wanted that 2.5D-ish classical format. But I didn't expect that people at this day and age would still be asking for that. And so where that left us was why, and we had some good ideas, and then it was like, okay, but if we're gonna go there, how do we expand it? And that's something where we, we created a term we call 2.9D, which is allowing you to enter the dimension more and you have full mobility around this world, even though it's still playing in a classical format of 2.5D. Ted, I don't know about you, but um, and you hear it all the time, you know, 100 people give you a compliment and then one dogs you, but you're thinking about the one who dogged you yeah. all night long. Like before we started making games, Ted, before, you know, anyone ever heard of me or, or uh, and I'm curious about you, but uh, I, w I was like, okay, uh, I don't believe these celebrities or I don't believe these actors when they say they don't read their own reviews. Of course they do. 
And then I was like, no, I, I totally believe that. <laughs> because it's like to know how, you know, when you do get hammered, and I've been hammered by the audience a few times, you know, through the years, I've said a few stupid things or out of, out of place things or mistimed things or whatever, you know. And, uh, but when you get hammered by the internet, man, it's a brutal beating, right? <laughs> like, it is. Yeah. It's, and it's hard, it's hard, as you said, not to kind of glom onto the few things that may be negative first and ignore the mm-hmm. positives. Uh, I think it's human nature. If you only listen to feedback and try to make the work a complete reflection of what others tell you or want, the work will be conventional and flat. Soulstorm, The Abe's Exodus, retelling, Oddworld, Soulstorm. Unfortunately, and I say this genuinely, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm genuinely sad that Soulstorm is as underwhelming and disappointing. And I was looking forward to Soulstorm coming out. Seven years in the making. But Soulstorm for me just really missed the mark. And Enemy variety and combos. Quite the interesting segment title, huh? <laughs> well, let's go through it. In Exodus, we have regular slicks, flying slicks, crawling slicks, slogs, Baby slogs, gluckens, paramites, scrabs, fleeches, and breeders. All of them are distinct from each other, and most of them are even compatible with each other if placed in the same area. And in quite a few areas in Exodus, this is even put to really good use. Hell, they could even be used with other gameplay elements like drills and other mudokens. Take Soulstorm, unfortunately, effectively removes all of the above in favor for extremely linear and segmented encounters. But before I explain a bit more about that, Soulstorm has Greeters, Sleeches, Slogs, Regular Slicks, Shotgun Slicks, Rocket Launcher Slicks, Flamethrower Slicks, Machine Gun Slicks, Sniper Slicks, and then multiply the number of Slicks here by 2, excluding the Sniper Slicks for the flying ones. That's 14 enemies in the game. That's 4 more than what you encounter in Exodus. And yet, the encounters feel more repetitive than Exodus's encounters. But how can that possibly be the case with more enemies? Well, for one, it's because the grounded and flying slicks are the most prevalent encounters that you can, well, encounter. They take up 11 out of the 14 possible enemies that you can come across in the game. Do the math, round it up, and that becomes 78.6% of the enemy roster being slicks. The worst part, you ask? The grounded and flying slicks, excluding the sniper slicks, all deal with you in nearly the exact same way, due to them sharing nearly all of the same weapons with each other which makes the flying slicks pretty much indistinguishable from regular slicks when it comes to facing them for the most part. They're just slicks that fly now. In Exodus, slicks took up 30% of the enemy roster, and even then, flying and crawling slicks had distinguishably different gameplay that required them to be played around with differently than their grounded selves. The enemies in Soulstorm, aside from maybe the slogs and slicks, as well as grounded and flying slicks together, just aren't really compatible with each other, I don't introduce any new variety in the gameplay. I think this point has been made painfully obvious by now, but the more segmented and unimaginative encounters and repetitive enemies has, honestly, severely dampened Soulstorm's enjoyment for me. What's there to look forward to if you're just going to be solving the exact same situations the exact same way every single time? What's there to look forward to if nearly 70% of the enemies in the game pretty much engage you the same way with the same weapons? Where's the gameplay elements like drills being used in conjunction with a slick? Why do greeters zap you even if you're standing still, pretty much ensuring that they cannot be used in conjunction with other enemies? Why are sleeches so pathetically easy to deal with that they're nowhere near the same ballpark as their former selves as fleeches, and to the point where they add nothing to the gameplay? <sighs> Such a shame to see Exodus's main driving force and source of enjoyment be completely absent in Soulstorm. <sighs> Moving on.